All right, let's take our Bibles now and look in John chapter 8. And my text is going to be from verse 56 to 59 to begin with. And I want to speak with you about Jesus as the I am. Jesus Christ as the I am. What does that mean? As we go alphabetically through the different titles of Christ, now we're in the eyes. And here in John chapter 8 and verse 56, our Lord's confronting the religious leaders of his day because they would not acknowledge him for who he was and is. And, uh, of course, they were touting that they had Abraham as their father. They were looking at their physical heritage. And yet Christ said here in verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. That means that Abraham, all those many years before, had been given faith to look forward to this one who was to come, the Lord Jesus, to be God in the flesh and who would lay down his life that he, Abraham, might be justified when Christ paid his debt. That's why Abraham was looking forward. What was he looking to? Christ said, my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? They were asking that in a mocking tone, not with a desire to tell us more. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, notice, I am. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was, but before Abraham was, I am. So that's that title that Christ takes to himself here that we want to consider together because that word I am is actually a word in the Hebrew from which we get the name Jehovah. It's a verb. It means to be. Remember when I was studying the Hebrew language, we used the be verb as we conjugated different verbs. And that was one we started with. I am, you are, he is, she is. But it means... It's, it's the, the name of Jehovah himself that is I am. So when Christ says here, I am, he clearly is saying he is the God of the Old Testament. Just as he's the everlasting God himself. And they understood what he was saying because in verse 59 it says, Then took they up stones to cast at him. See, there were many times they would have killed our Lord had they been given the will to do so, the ability to do so. People talk about free will. They didn't have free will. They couldn't determine how it was that Christ would be killed and when. That was all purposed by God himself. They tried. They took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. That's amazing when you think about how he was hidden, just like Moses was hidden in the bulrushes and protected all those years, right under Pharaoh's nose. Here he hid himself. You would think an entire nation looking for him could have easily found him, but they couldn't because he's sovereign God and no man could lay a hand on him but what he determined that time and that place, which was to be the cross. He wasn't to die in any other manner than the cross. He hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Here's a whole throng that couldn't stop our Lord Jesus Christ. How different this so-called Jesus is today that's being preached, that 
he'd like to do some things but can't because man won't let him. Here we see where the Lord Jesus as the I am is unhindered and unperturbed by anything that men would seek to do against him. So here in this study, I want us to take a look at various instances of our Lord Jesus using these I am statements, which first of all, highlight his divinity. When he says, I am, that means he's God. That's the clear declaration. But it also highlights his mission in coming. He didn't come to win a popularity contest. He came rather to reveal himself as that God apart from whom none can know God or come to God. He said, I am the way. See, there it is. I am the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So first of all, it's here we have the full unveiling of the glories of Christ. That's what I want us to see here. This isn't just isn't a statement. But here in this, summed up in I am, all of the glories of God are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, hidden in that body of flesh, and yet, nonetheless, everything that we need to know about God is revealed in him. All of the attributes of God are in him. And secondly, it's here that we behold him dwelling with God even before time began. If he says, before Abraham was, I am, we can also say that even before time began, he is. And that before any creature was formed. If you look over in John chapter 1, and you're going to notice here through this message, I didn't know this until I fully studied this, but all of the I am statements pertaining to Christ are found right here in John. This was the Spirit's direction for him to set Christ forth as the divine God in the flesh. And that's why in the very first verse of his gospel, we read what he declared. In the beginning was the word. So if you go back to the beginning of creation, even Christ is already there in the beginning. And it says the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So it's a very clear, simple statement. And should be easy enough to understand that when Christ says, I am, he's declaring that he was with God, his father, even before time began and before ever there was a creature formed. That's why all preeminence belongs unto him. But thirdly, it's here that he is denominated or called the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When we talk about him being the I am, that means he is the only begotten of the Father. Yes, he has children that are begotten by his grace and adopted, but they're adopted. We're talking about him being the very express image of God the Father as de described there in John 1, 14. It says the word was made flesh and the translators properly put that in capital W and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. So for Christ to declare himself as the I am, this is what he's declaring. That special place that he has there with the father as the only begotten full of grace and truth there's no grace or truth to be had by any sinner apart from him granting it 
So I am. Stop and think about that. And then fourthly, here we read again in the Gospel of John how John the Baptist bore record of him. Same record over in John chapter 1 and verse 34. John the Baptist said, And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So it's not that God first created his Son as an angel, like some pretend, and then adopted him as a son. No. He is the Son of God. See that I-S always has been, I am. It's in the present tense. Even as God, the Father is, so is his Son. And he's the one to whom John bear record. He was in the flesh, John the Baptist's cousin, Elizabeth and Mary being sisters. But yet, John does not look to that physical relationship as being anything of importance or significance for him. He acknowledges him even above any earthly relationships that there were. He said, this is the Son of God and bears record to that. And fifthly, it's here that we read also in John chapter 2 and verse 11. See, all this is leading up to what Christ declared there in John 8. <clears throat> it wasn't that he was hiding this and then all of a sudden sprang it on people saying, okay, no, now I can tell you I, I am. No. Here we read in John chapter 2 and verse 11 this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and what does it say? And manifested forth his glory. Why did Christ do these miracles? Well, it says right there to manifest his glory, to, to demonstrate, to show who he is as the I am. Only God could do what he did. In healing the sick and raising the dead, it was to manifest himself as the I am. So when we read the miracles, that's what we're to see. Christ is the I am. And then sixthly, it's here that we're told in John 2 and verse 19, this, this struck them when Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. Herod had been adding on to that second temple that Zerubbabel had rebuilt after the captivity in Babylon and they were proud of that temple. And yet the Lord here as the I am is declaring that that temple even was a type and picture of himself. And that's why when we read the Old Testament, we look for Christ in the types and pictures and prophecies because he is. Some might say, well, he wasn't on earth then at that time, doesn't matter. You go all the way back in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Who created it? Christ. He's the I am. It's just that in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. That's when he was manifested for who he is, but he is the I am. And so here we're told that he, as the savior, declared that, when they destroyed that temple in three days, he would raise it up. Of course, they mocked him. You can see that in verse 20. They said, 40 and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of what? The temple of his body. And when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So for him to be the I am, that means he's the resurrection and the life. In him is life. And then, seventh, here we learn that as the I am, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. There's a lot to this I am. 
Who is he? Well, he's the very beloved of the Father. Over here in John chapter 3 and verse 35, our Lord says this. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. When he was saying, I am, he's saying he's God. There's no, no other to seek but God in him. And with that comes all authority, power, to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. And that's why it says in verse 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Notice that. As the I am, he has everlasting life. And any that believe on him, he has already granted them that everlasting life. Doesn't say he that believeth on the Son shall have everlasting life. That's how many misquoted. No. None could believe were it not Christ giving them that life to believe. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. It's talking about one that never believes. They're born in unbelief, they live in unbelief, they die in unbelief. And they'll not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's the evidence that God's wrath is upon a sinner and that Christ didn't pay their debt is that they live and die in unbelief. We all were born in unbelief, and yet the Lord didn't leave us there. He drew us to himself if he paid our debt. But all others, the wrath of God abides on them. It's not based upon their decision, but... It's based upon God having paid their sin debt there at the cross. So that's summed up in who he is as the I am. The father loves him, the son, and has given all things into his hand. And then number eight, it's in this gospel that we hear our Lord saying this in John chapter 5 and verses 21 to 24, 23. He says, as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them. So this is showing Christ's divinity. Who is it that raises the dead? It's God the Father. But it says here, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. That shows the harmony that there is between God the Father and God the Son. For him to say, I am, he's declaring that harmony. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And here it's very clear. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. person can't say, well, I believe in God. I just don't believe in his Son. Well, you don't believe in God then. Because he that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father. That's why it's so vital in every message to honor the Son because God's only glorified in his Son as the I am. If it were us saying, I am, it would be boastful because we're nothing but sinners. But when Christ declares it, he's declaring the truth, his oneness with the Father. And then what we saw here in John chapter 8 and verse 58, where he declares before Abraham was, I am. See, all that leads up to it, that the one that, Abraham saw was none other than God the Father. So this goes all the way back to it was none other than Christ. This goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. You say what, what's the origin of this description of Christ as the I am? Well this is when God raised up Moses and was sending him to the leaders of Israel who were in Egypt at the time in captivity to go tell them that he would deliver them. And uh, Moses says in verse 13 of Exodus 3, he said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? You see, this particular name was particular to the children of Israel. It wasn't for everybody. This is a, this is a name of covenant. 
mercy of God with a people. In verse 14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And I love that this is putting all caps here. And he said, thou shalt say, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And that's where that name was revealed. God has always been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Christ, the I am. But it was just at this particular time and way that God purposed to reveal himself. It establishes just the, the present tense. You can never think of God as having a beginning, a middle, or an end. He is, I am, and so Christ. He's eternal, self-existent. There's nothing that God needed outside of himself in order to make him complete. There's some people that act as if God purposed to save sinners because he got lonely. Now, he didn't need anything to complete who he is. I am is a declaration of his self-existence and everything summed up in him, between him, the Son, and the Spirit. And so this is where we could literally spend many messages going down through and looking at how Christ is the I am. There are seven particular statements that describe Christ as the I am. And all of these, as I said, are in the gospel according to John that we have here. I'll just quote these for you. In John 6, 35, you can write that reference down. He said, I am the bread of life. So for him to be the bread of life, that means that he is life itself. It's that which is essential. Bread, just as bread is essential to life. So he is life. That's one way he declares himself as I am. That's in John 6, 35. Then in John 8 and verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. So here again, our Lord is speaking to those around him and declares that whoever follows him would not walk in darkness, but would have the light of life. We're talking about though he's the light of the world, it's not in some general sense. He's using that in the specific sense, the light of sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue that the Father has given to him, John 8, 12. So I am, when you hear that word, I am the light of the world. He always has been, always will be. In John 10, 10 and verse 7, he declares himself as the door of the sheep. Some of this we've already studied before. I am the door of the sheep. And uh, therefore, in that statement, the Lord is declaring that he is the only way of salvation. He is the only salvation of who? His sheep. A door is what you enter in by. And any that are saved have been saved by him as the door. I am, John 10, 7. And then John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. John 10 and verse 11. He's talking there about the good shepherd laying down his life for his sheep. And that's how he reveals himself to his sheep as the one who came and laid down his life. I am. He doesn't say I will be if you will. No, I am the good shepherd. He calls out his own and cares for his own, having laid down his life for his own. That's in John 10 and verse 11. Then John 11, verse 25, he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's our hope of eternal life. It's in who he is. And it demonstrates his power over death and his promise to his own of eternal life because he is the ever-existent one who gives life and sustains that life. John eleven twenty five, 25. 
And then one we know well, this, in the sixth, sixth statement, he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. He is the exclusive way. He didn't come just to show the way or to tell the truth or to point sinners to the life. No, he is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He embodies everything about who the way is and what the truth is and what the life is. And then the last time you find it in John is in John 15, 1, where he says, I am the true vine. John 15, 1. And my father is the vine dresser. What he's showing there is that he is that seed that was planted, the true vine, and grew up from which now the branches grow and the fruit on those branches. That's his elect, that's his people that are the fruit of who he is. I am the true vine. And uh, therefore abiding in him, we have life. All of these are a claim to his deity, his divinity, and also a profound declaration of salvation in him. That's why we look to no other. That in him is the fullness of redemption, is the fullness of God's justification, is the fullness of life eternal. As I said, we could easily take a message on each one of those, and we have at some point in the past, but uh, what a, a glorious expression of Christ is being the I am of God.